Gentlemen, consider if you will uh, a dual overhead cam engine. This particular drawing is from a Suzuki uh, 1.6 liter engine in and around 2010 vintage. So yeah, better part of 10 years ago. So what do we have in a traditional layout? Four cylinder, dual overhead cam. So this is an intake um, sprocket, the exhaust sprockets, of course, driving their uh, respective camshafts. And of course the crankshaft, two to one. Uh, ratio of course uh, nothing new there for a four-stroke engine right so recently I mean within the last couple of days I've got myself another vehicle and now I have to consider the complexities of a variable valve time engine so the VVT system this is only with respect to uh, Suzuki's uh, 1.6 liter 2.4 liter uh, in and around 10 years ago uh, plus or minus a wee bit so as it turns out, the two to one ratio from your crank to your cam turns out is no quite two to one with respect to the intake cam. Um, the variable valve timing uh, system that Suzuki uses is actually only implemented on the intake cam and the exhaust uh, cam is a traditional sprocket. So let's look a, a wee bit closer into how they actually uh, uh, execute this design and what it's all about, why they've done it and how it's, uh, as I said, how it's actually uh, carried out on the car itself. It's quite interesting. So how they've gone about it, Suzuki has gone about it in roughly 2010, um, plus or minus a wee bit, was they actually used a cam phaser on the intake um, cam. So if you can, if you can uh, appreciate these two black lines, if they're shown in with a fixed system, that is to say a non-variable valve timing engine, um, this fixed timing, again, would only be optimized at a particular point in the operating curve. If you had the facility to actually vary um, to advance or retard from the, from the baseline setting, uh, the intake valve operation, what you then would be able to do is change the valve overlap, the degree of overlap. And by changing that degree of overlap, gives the engine the ability to either generate more power, be more fuel efficient, or generate less emissions. So by varying the point of what actually actuates the intake valves, it gives you that flexibility with really no downside. But yeah, modest increase in complexity of the engine, I suppose. Now appreciate that this is cam phasing. That is to say it only shifts um, in time, in relative degrees, if you will, the uh, the difference uh, between the exhaust valve and the intake valve operating actuation time. There is no change in lift. There is no change in duration with this system. Some other systems, other manufacturers have more complicated systems that can actually do one or the other, perhaps both, perhaps all three. I'm, I'm not sure, but I know there's multiple systems actually out there. We're strictly dealing variable valve timing with a cam phaser on the intake valve, on the intake uh, cam itself with it for the intake valves. So what we have is the cam phaser itself shown in the uh, orange and uh, yellow. The orange is representative of both the sprocket and the housing, which are fixed together. And the rotor, uh, which is through bolted, to the camshaft itself proper uh, is free to rotate within the housing. Um, the housing itself actually provides us uh, with these three chambers uh, which are split by the rotor itself and that gives us facility to pour oil pressure uh, in order to rotate the rotor in a clockwise or counterclockwise direction via differential pressure which we'll show you on another drawing uh, momentarily. Um, but the actuation is uh, provided, as I said, via oil pressure. So this is the oil sump itself shown on the drawing, the oil pump, oil filter. Uh, so we have oil pressure and oil return. Uh, that pressure and return is actually controlled via the oil control valve. The oil control valve consists of a coil, um, which will either extend or retract a spool valve, which is inside the uh, oil control valve assembly itself. So that's duty cycle controlled in order to position it accordingly for advance or retard. And um, as I said, the actuation, the muscle pressure, if you will, is actually oil pressure, hydraulic pressure, uh, oil pressure itself in actuality 
provided via the two ports in order to rotate the rotor independent of the um, of the uh, sprocket housing so again we'll see that in greater detail on another drawing this is a wee bit difficult to see i've actually scaled up the drawing so you can appreciate the actuation and uh, realize that the system is actually monitored via the cam and crank sensors themselves not shown on this drawing so let's take a wee bit of a closer look at the cam phaser itself and see how it actually functions so here's kind of a two-dimensional model that I've mocked up of the uh, the cam phaser itself. Although Suzuki never actually uses the term cam phaser in the manual as far as I can tell. They still refer to it as the cam sprocket. Other manufacturers call it a phaser. To me it makes sense to call it a phaser. I've heard some guys actually refer to it as a dephaser. What actually makes even more sense if you consider if the set timing is in phase this is actually providing us facility to take it out of phase in the interest of realizing our efficiencies. But um, anyway, that's perhaps academic. So here's a, a quick look at the model. Again, uh, item one is the sprocket. Item two, the um, um, this is the advanced chamber. Item two, shown with the uh, red representing um, uh, the advanced pressure. Um, item three is the uh, retard chamber shown with the uh, green uh, green coloring and uh, item four is the housing itself again the sprocket and the housing are fixed together and um, item five is actually our rotator here shown in uh, in uh, in yellow and um, you can see so our rotor would actually have this amount of freedom of travel within the housing itself so, um, and item six is actually the seals that are providing as an oil tight, pressure tight seal between the rotor and the housing itself. So can you appreciate that if we port pressure into the red coloring that we would have, we'd rotate in a clockwise direction, allowing us for uh, some advance. And if we were to port pressure into the green side of the chamber, we'd rotate the rotor back counterclockwise, retarding the timing. So again, I want to stress guys, just for conceptual uh, appreciation, with that we're only showing the rotor here rotating uh, relative to the housing but in reality as you can imagine this entire thing is rotating via the uh, the timing chain of course so it's relative motion between the housing and the rotor that we're actually talking about with respect to advancing or returning the timing Okay, for those of you that are actually still with me, I'll try and make this brief because I don't want to bore you guys. I admittedly have a habit of dragging things out in too much detail. So I'll try and speed this up in all three modes that we're going to consider. So here again is the uh, the rotor and the housing actually shown in the uh, cross hatching. Um, and what we have is uh, oil pressure, both the pressure shown in orange and the return shown in uh, shown in yellow. So again, we have our oil control valve here. So in the mode where, where we're actually looking for timing advance, what modes would that actually be? That would be in uh, average engine loads scenario um, or a low to average RPM with a high engine load situation. So in those scenarios would actually be it'd be advantageous to, no pun intended, to advance the, time, the valve timing at which point in time uh, from the engine control module itself we will up the duty cycle. By upping the duty cycle it'll actually via the uh, coil here in the oil control uh, uh, valve it'll actually cause the spool valve to displace to the right. By doing so the oil pressure that can then actually come up into the chamber here and actually cause the uh, and at the same time the return would open on the on the right hand port so it would actually cause the rotor in the uh, in the cam phaser to actually rotate clockwise relative to the housing again the whole works of it is rotating but relative to the housing the uh, rotor would actually and the cam itself would rotate relative to the uh, to the sprocket and housing so again that would be a high duty cycle where we're looking to advance the timing Conversely, if we had an engine operating uh, conditions that we're calling for uh, valve timing retard, uh, what, what scenario would that would be? Well, we'd have maximum uh, valve timing retard at either uh, engine start, engine stop, or idle in this condition where we would have a low engine coolant temperature. Of course, that would all be synonymous with a cold start scenario. Um, we'd want to retard the timing. In addition, we'd want to uh, retard the timing in the event of a light engine load, but higher, uh, a light engine load or a high RPM and high engine load scenario. Those, those would also call for valve timing retard. And again, it would be just the opposite scenario. From the engine control module, it would drop the duty cycle, uh, hence re re retracting the uh, spool valve within the oil control valve itself. And of course, then we'd port the oil pressure in the opposite direction, 
the uh, rotor in the cam phaser would rotate relative to the housing and sprocket and would actually achieve uh, valve timing retard. So in the last scenario here, where we'd actually have um, a static operating condition, maybe you're on a steady grade, a flat grade on the highway at fixed speed and a fixed load on the car, and that's when the, uh, the spool valve would go into a cutoff scenario, we'd have um, no change in pressure or return to either side of the uh, either side of the uh, the rotor and we'd have fixed the valve timing. The engine's happy, it's optimized for whatever operating condition is transpiring at that particular instant in time and um, so there'd be no relative mo movement between the rotor and the uh, sprocket and housing. So just to wrap up here uh, fellas, the um, again I hope this is all making sense and to just try and close the loop on the, uh, the control side of things um, here's a, um, a scope reference waveform from the manual itself. This is actually showing the oil control valve uh, control signal uh, with the engine actually operating. This is for the 1.6 liter engine that's actually specifying again in and around the 2010 model year. And you can actually see uh, on the scope trace here, uh, what we have is a voltage waveform. Again, duty cycle controlled. This is an idle scenario um, where the, well, the car is idling, basically. And you can see just how low of a duty cycle that is across the uh, oil control valve. Again, from the uh, ECM, of course. ECM looking at the prevailing operating conditions on the car. In this particular scenario, uh, idle, uh, idle situation, a very low duty cycle on the, uh, on the uh, coil of the oil control valve, as we would expect from the description of operation that we just went through. Okay, for you gluttons for punishment that are actually still with me here, uh, one last drawing. So this is actually uh, the oil control valve, the signal across the oil control valve, again, of course, from the ECM. And the scenario is they, uh, they're driving the vehicle at um, 20 kilometers and then it's wide open throttle scenario. So you can see the duty cycle actually jump to essentially 100% here on the scope. Um, again, in keeping with the description and operation, uh, the understanding of how the system actually operates. Um, yeah, so I hope that all actually makes uh, some sense to you guys. I found it actually extremely interesting. I actually learned quite a bit in the last couple of days looking at the manual. If I find it interesting, maybe somebody else will actually find it interesting. So let me know what you think and uh, if there was any points in it that weren't clear uh, that we can expand upon. Uh, I'll actually probably at some point in um, the not too distant future actually uh, take the scope out and actually look at these waveforms across the oil control valve again just to uh, further enhance the actual understanding in the system so uh that's that boys we'll leave it at that for the night i'm starting to get tired to be honest it's two o'clock in the morning i think i've had enough okay cheers